friends of the Dan and Carol Burak Distinguished Lecture Series, I welcome you. My name is Christine Vitovic. I am a member of the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources faculty, and it is truly an honor for me to be able to introduce today's speaker, a mentor, a colleague, and a friend from the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Jonathan Patz. Jonathan is a doctor of medicine and a master of public health. He occupies the distinguished John P. Holton Chair of Health and the Environment. He is a professor and director of the Global Health Institute, which he founded at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He is a lead author for over 15 years of the IPCC reports, um, which was the group that won the Nobel Prize. If you Google Jonathan Patz, you will find much more, and it is all very impressive. We are very fortunate that Jonathan accepted and our invitation and actually showed up despite our inability to provide superior conditions for his Nordic ski training. <laughs> you see, <laughs> Jonathan subjects himself annually to the tortures and rigor of the 35-mile Berkebeiner ski race in Wisconsin, and he always finishes well up in his age group. And worse, he claims he enjoys it. One year, he had a smile frozen upon his face as he blasted past me on the half Berkey, the cordelope. And I will never remember that moment. I will never forget that moment. I will always remember it. <laughs> a fanatic when it comes to health benefits of human powered transportation, Jonathan bicycles to work, putting his legs and lungs where his mouth is. And he does so even in the snowy and sub zero Wisconsin winters that rival those of Vermont legend. Even in his office, he uses a stationary bicycle for a desk, rather than the standing desks that have become so popular here on our own campus. Those are just some of his personal qualities. The professional endeavor you have all come here to share in today is Jonathan's work to address the health challenges brought on by climate change. A colleague once likened the perils we face by co from climate change to those of the atomic bomb. These are the two greatest threats to all life our planet has faced. The millisecond flash in the New Mexico desert that ushered in the atomic age was utterly devoid of ambiguity. No one could ignore nor represent, misrepresent it. In stark contrast, the crisis we face today has come, up, come upon us in a more insidious way, creeping up, obscure at first, but increasingly insistent. And so we are very fortunate indeed to have Jonathan Patz, who somehow manages to think deeply and creatively about the seemingly intractable problem of climate change, while at the same time bringing optimism that sees in this crisis an opportunity for a healthier future for us all. And so, friends and colleagues, we give you Dr. Jonathan Patz. Christine, that was a, a very, very kind introduction. Uh, when you said that you couldn't remember that moment, you were actually correct, because there's no way that I would whiz past you in a ski race. She's a ski racer herself. Um, whoever has a chair right next to them, can you raise your hand and let uh, folks that are standing come, come fill in the chairs? We want to, you don't have to stand up for this lecture. Only at the end, at the, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the other thing that uh, Christine did mention is that I, I was on her thesis committee, and that is one of my greatest honors because Christine is a rising su superstar on campus. So stay tuned for her research, which is really cool. So today I want to talk about climate change, and I want to talk about why confronting climate change could be the greatest opportunity for health that we've had in a very long time. And it really is a, a true honor to be the uh, uh, Burrack uh, Distinguished Lecturer this month. And I really, it's a pleasure to come back to UVM and meet faculty and students who are just doing wonderful things. I've been very stimulated by uh, the engagement today and uh, always, always a pleasure. Now, you should, all of you should have seen these maps before. This is from the latest United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I guess I use this pointer because maybe you can both, 
Oh, I won't. Anyway, um, these are the maps. And on, on the left, you can see the lightly shaded map of the world, uh, representing the sort of best case scenario of emissions into the future. If we ratchet down our emissions and we really get to renewable energy in a hurry, maybe we'll just warm up, you know, on average one degree centigrade by the end of the century. But if we continue uh, to have energy consumption at business as usual levels, we're going to uh, warm up to seven degrees centigrade on average. Now, of course, the earth is mostly water. So what that means for land areas where people live uh, is that they may even be hotter. By the way, I see one, two, three, four seats. Um, raise your hand again if you have a, an open seat. Come and relax, you guys, in the back. There's seats up here if you want to sit down. OK, pop quiz. Who's a, whoever is a student. Are we, right now, are we heading more to the left or the right? Who says left? Who says right? Actually, right now, we are heading worse. We're heading beyond that right, uh, we're heading beyond worst case scenario with our energy consumption right now. So we are looking at a warmer future. Now, I hope all of you have seen this slide too, because I've been using this slide for, you know, since 1998, that sort of sums up the, you know, thinking about the physical attributes of climate change, rising temperatures, sea level rise from thermal expansion of salt water, and melting glaciers, land-based glaciers into the ocean, sea level rise, but also hydrologic extremes, extremes in the water cycle, more floods and more droughts. And these attributes cut across all sorts of health impacts. It's why I thought and started studying the health effects of climate change, thinking that this is the greatest public health threat that we face, thinking of all these exposure pathways, thinking about direct effects of heat waves, of air pollution, especially ground level smog ozone, temperature sensitive, and aeroallergens like ragweed pollen. Those are big health issues. But also there are so many climate sensitive infectious diseases, especially carried by insects, these vector-borne disease, these vector-borne diseases like malaria, uh, West Nile virus, Zika virus. Now if we think about extremes of the water cycle, more flooding, that means more water contamination and more waterborne diseases. Um, thinking about water availability and droughts, that means pressure on our food supply. And the issue of malnutrition is a very big topic in climate change. Now the bottom one, looking at mental health and environmental refugees. Uh, I'll come to this later when we do a little case study on Syria. Uh, but this is one that's very difficult to quantify, but maybe the iceberg under the tip of the iceberg as far as large problems, health and societal problems when you have displaced uh, populations. And we're learning more every day. I, uh, at a recent conference in San Francisco I attended, there's a new study in Asia, Southeast Asia, where they see preeclampsia in pregnant women, hypertension and preeclampsia, which is potentially fatal, very serious condition in pregnancy because of sea level rise and salination of freshwater aquifers in coastal areas. The salt in the, in the water was causing hypertension and preeclampsia. I'm going to give just a couple of, of examples of of uh, health impacts that we've studied and quantified, and then dive into addressing climate change and look at climate change policy. We published this study a couple of years ago when we looked at the frequency of intense heat waves. Now, we looked at all cities in, Eastern, in the Eastern US, and we this is one just looking at New York City. Right now, New York has 
about um, 18 days that are 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees centigrade. I give this talk in various settings. So for you guys, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that, so New York only has, I'm sorry, 13 days. 13 days on average for a summertime in New York, 13 days that are hotter than 90 degrees. Well, by the middle of the century, um, we've, we've worked uh, on climate downscaled models for this region and find that by mid-century that number could triple. So instead of 13 days hotter than 90 degrees, New York City will have 39 days hotter than 90 degrees. That's a concern for public health. The issue of infectious diseases um, is a big topic and this is why uh, this little advertisement about global warming's greatest threat may be the smallest. And the picture of a mosquito here. Okay, for the students, what's the difference between us mammals and a mosquito besides that we can't fly? And uh, Christine has guaranteed me, she has told me with 51% certainty that you don't suck blood. So what's the big difference? Mammals and insects, like a mosquito. Somebody, quick. You're not a student. Yeah, so okay. They reproduce quickly, yeah. So, and they're sensitive to environmental conditions. Okay, so mammals and insects or reptiles? Exactly. Cold-blooded. So that means if they're cold-blooded, whatever the air temperature is around that cold-blooded organism, that's the body temperature. So, you know, our body temperature stays the same, more or less, but whatever the air temperature is will determine the body temperature of that mosquito. Now, what if that mosquito is carrying dangerous parasites or viruses, like malaria? These are two of them the um, two of the parasites, uh, types of malaria parasites, the most dominant ones, uh, Plasmodium falciparum, mostly in Africa, uh, Plasmodium vivax. And this is a graph of what happens inside the mosquito rather than in people. This is why this is called the extrinsic incubation period, the development speed in the mosquito. And notice that for the, the, the y-axis, which is temperature, as the temperature goes up, the number of days that it takes that parasite to cross the stomach lining of the mosquito and develop into an infective sporozoite in the salivary glands, so when she takes the next bite, she transmits disease, you can see that the warmer the temperature, the fewer the days that that mosquito needs to be infectious. So hotter temperatures, mean more infectious mosquitoes or more quickly infectious. Now, I want to warn you that, you know, climate is not everything with malaria. There's human uh, migration, there's drug resistance, there's governmental programs and pesticide uh, or, uh, you know, mosquito control. And so I'll tell you that any very large epidemic of malaria, however, has an abnormal climate attached to it. So there are a lot of things that you need. You absolutely need the right amount of temperature and below a certain temperature, you can't support the development of malaria. Below about uh, 15 or 16 degrees centigrade, you cannot have um, malaria. It cannot develop in the mosquito. That's why it's a tropical disease. So what about another mosquito-borne disease that uh, erupted last year in South America? Uh, actually 2015 into 2016. So question about Zika virus and the XO from, from last year. Well, we know a lot about this mosquito, Aedes aegypti. It's a carrier of a dengue fever, yellow fever, chikungunya virus, and Zika virus. And this mosquito um, has been studied very widely 
And the disease, the most prevalent mosquito-borne virus in the world is dengue fever. And this map shows you the range of where that mosquito occurs across the tropics. And in Southeast Asia, this mosquito has especially uh, been studied, the mosquito and the uh, dengue virus system uh, has been studied. And it seems to be seasonal, not a surprise. Many of these vector-borne diseases occur, they peak at a certain month. Well, it seems to be there's a synchrony, a pattern of transmission, which of course is seasonal, but every now and then, you get a massive epidemic. And so this study uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences two years ago, looked at this synchrony of dengue fever in Southeast Asia and found these years that lit up in red being major epidemics, more, much more than normal. And guess what? Those two years, coincided with strong El Nino years. In fact, 1997, right here, is the strongest El Nino year we have had in recent history until last year. So the El Nino of 2005-2016 was equal in strength to 1997, but lasted longer. And if any climatologists are here, I know, you know, you'll say, well, it depends where you measure it. And, you know, it's probably the strongest, whatever. But let's say it's equal to 1997. So either the strongest or tied for the strongest El Nino in history. Um, we've actually been studying uh, the distribution of these temperatures over Brazil. Um, and we're in the middle of uh, sending off this paper that shows that the temperatures in Brazil were four to five times um, standard, four to five standard deviations hotter than a 30 year record normal temperature. So the temperature was unprecedented. And a couple of months ago, also I'm picking on the, picking out of the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. This is a study that came out a few months ago. And what it shows is the the vectorial capacity for Zika virus or dengue fever from this mosquito. So the, because of the climate, the probability of infection went up. And basically, if you look at this last bar right here, you know, that's the highest risk level of that mosquito being able to transmit virus based on uh, weather factors, because this is a very, this mosquito is very sensitive to um, extreme temperature. So in the entomology, the climate shows high, very high risk for Zika. And again, Zika is a confusing story. Travel, international travel is very much part of why Zika arrived, when it arrived. But just like West Nile virus in the United States, in 1999, West Nile came into the US from international travel, came in likely, they traced it back to a plane from uh, the Middle East, uh, you know, the, the strain, the, the, the sequence. Uh, so probably came in from a flight from the Middle East, but when West Nile e emerged, it happened to be the hottest July ever recorded in New York City's history. So. Could this Zika story be similar to West Nile, where this came in from international travel, but the unprecedented temperatures, could that have been a factor? I don't know the answer, but it sure is interesting and worth studying further. Now, before I shift to policy, just a quick reminder that climate change is not just about temperature, it's also extremes of the water cycle. And if you have you know, if you have drought, there are issues with, with uh, malnutrition. If you have flooding, uh, you have issues of water contamination. And these are global projections from the U.S. Global Change Research Program showing that the very heavy rainfall events, you know, the gully washers, you know, the two inches a day of rainfall, equivalent to two feet of snow, 
that the very heavy precipitation events, that's what's going to be increasing. And when we look at this type of rainfall intensity, um, we did a study around Chicago and found that by the middle of this century, because of that increased rainfall intensity, we'll see a doubling in these combined sewage overflow events, which happened already because of heavy rainfall event. So finally, I want to get to that last uh, issue about environmental refugees. And while you probably cannot see these graphs, I'll just summarize these graphs to, sh to say that you know, there are, there are soil moisture um, graphs, there are um, you know, winter rainfall, surface temperature. Bottom line is um, those hydrologic values add up to the fact that right before the Syrian Civil War, they had the most severe drought ever recorded in their instrumental record. It's also known that because of this drought, food prices went through the roof. It's also known that rural to urban migration increased several fold. And so there was a strain in cities. And I don't know how responsible this drought is for leading up to the Civil War and all of the hundreds of thousands of people that died and the millions of refugees. But these types of difficult to study questions and observations, you know, make me worry that some of these indirect effects from climate change could have knock-on effects that are enormous. Uh, and again, something that I can't tell you with confidence that that drought caused the Syrian civil war and everything that's erupted from it. But I can just tell you that it was an unprecedented event and led to food price shocks and changes in migration patterns and stress in cities. Um, someone else needs to, you know, it's a team of researchers that need to connect those dots further. So I want to end this part of the lecture and mention how there are some parts of the world that will be more quickly affected than other parts. And if you imagine sea level rise in a place like Bangladesh versus sea level rise in a place like Holland that already is below sea level and has all this engineering to hold the sea back, there's a difference in vulnerability. And there's also a difference in vulnerability when you think about where do we have diarrheal disease, malnutrition, and malaria. Those places are at risk first. But in a globalized world, increased disease anywhere affects all of us. So I gave this presentation on the ethics of climate change, the equity of climate change. And I had a really uh, an incredible audience five years ago, a distinguished gentleman, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And I presented the ethics of climate change uh, to him. And he is a very smart man. And he asked me, he said, Jonathan, if you know pollution kills, your country is not showing much compassion, right? And I, I had this, I said, listen, your holiness, it's not that simple. You know, when we built the steam engine and we started generating electricity from, from burning coal, it was a wonderful advance in technology. But we didn't know that, uh, that air pollution was dangerous until 1952, the London killer smog event that killed thousands of people. And we said, oh, maybe burning coal and having factories you know, in the middle of a city, in the middle of London, is not a good idea. Let's move the factories out of London. Let's put scrubbers on smokestacks. It was only then that we learned about the dangers of air pollution. We started doing something. And I said, it wasn't until, you know, like 1990 that we really understood that we're disrupting the Earth's climate and that could have very disastrous impacts on populations. Well, he looked at me and he said, Jonathan, it's 2011. It's 21 years later, you know, 
we know you know that you know you know this why is your country still burning all these fossil fuels so he got me thinking about that and i thought you know this issue of fossil fuels which is the cause the you know, main cause of climate change and emitting greenhouse gases also emits other nasty pollutants like particulate pollution and i thought you know maybe just thinking about combating climate change is the wrong angle to think about reducing fossil fuel emissions has enormous health benefits immediately forget about climate change if we get off of fossil fuels um, we can have immediate benefits and I'm not the only one thinking about this and there are lots of people that are realizing you know number one we've got to ramp ramp down on boss uh, really ratchet down on fossil fuels quickly and we had just a year a year and a half ago the conference of the parties the 21st conference of the parties of the united nations framework convention on climate change and i was so pleased that not only were the impact scientists and the climatologists at this meeting but there were business leaders there. There were 147 heads of state that attended this meeting. Not vice presidents, but presidents and prime ministers. That is more heads of state, the highest number of heads of state ever gathered in one place for one event. So that was unprecedented. And most of the countries of the world had already submitted their commitments to reduce fossil fuel consumption so i felt very positive <clears throat> going to this meeting and and seeing the outcome this is uh, bill gates and there were <clears throat> other uh prominent and influential investors <clears throat> and as of november of this past year <clears throat> november 4th enough countries representing a majority of greenhouse gas emissions around the world have signed on so the paris climate agreement went into effect in november so i think at that time i was you know feeling like you know we are really we've got inertia that you know we are coasting and um so I, I've had the benefit of talking to some students today, and uh, somebody, of course, said, so what, what about the elephant in the room, right? So um, I just, uh, you know, updating my slides. Uh, this is from today, 20, uh, January 26th. Um, reaction to the new US administration, the doomsday clock was set 30 seconds closer to midnight. Uh, with two and a half minutes to go. And, you know, we, we are at a time where we're at an unprecedented, we, we are really, um, we've made so many gains in the science and in the, in the global leadership. The Paris meeting was incredible. The commitments are incredible as far as looking at 30 to 40% reduction in greenhouse gases over the next 30 years across many countries. Um, but we have a new administration. Um, and so it's, it's, we, we need to sort of think about, okay, where are we with the science and the policy? Um, I, you know, there's some positive things. You know, this is one about Ivanka Trump uh, interested. And, you know, whatever, uh, our president has said in the campaign, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of momentum around the world at different levels. We don't need to just think about the national governments or the international treaties. Um, U.S. mayors urged Trump to recognize the urgent climate threat to cities. So changing the frame about climate as a threat to cities. President Obama talked about climate threat on national security. So the idea that climate change, it's not just about polar bears and it's not just about ice cover or ecosystems, which 
are really, you know, that's an important impact. But there are different frames to view climate change. And when you think about what is necessary that came out of the Paris Agreement as far as projections for getting to a certain level of warming and the, the ideal that climate uh, impact assessment scientists has said is that we want to stay below two degrees centigrade but above two degrees centigrade average you know ecosystems and, and agriculture and other things start to break down we want to stay below this threshold level of two degrees well the Paris Agreement you know, lots, you know, commitments of a third to half reduction in CO2 emissions in the next couple of decades, enormous commitments, will still only get us um, halfway. It will only get us to the commitments on the table, the big commitments, still only get us to a warming of 3.5 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. So that's great you know right now that's where we're heading we're heading to eight degrees fahrenheit or 4.5 centigrade if we don't do anything if we make these big steps from the paris agreement we'll get to 3.5 but that's not enough to get us down below a threshold of two degrees centigrade so we need to urgently get that down and this is where the health frame comes in I think that you know to get these immediate actions, adding the focus of environment and economic damages, I think that the health frame can get us there quicker because health is a nonpartisan issue. If you think about, you know, I don't, you know, I my opinion, my opinion is that health is far less partisan than environment. How about that? Is that fair? <laughs> There we go, okay. So, and this is where I think we have a, a great message and a message that all of you, I hope, will, will scream out loud and clear. And I think that policies to combat climate change could be free or looking at public health co-benefits, you know, side benefits from greenhouse gas emission policy, from climate mitigation policy, the health co-benefits could be a net gain and so I'm going to show you the evidence for that and I I think the main opportunities are across these three big sectors energy sector especially electric uh, power generation the transportation sector transportation and urban planning and food systems I think there are other sectors and other benefits but these three are are huge and directly beneficial to human health let's look at the first one Energy is related to air pollution, air quality. Today, according to the World Health Organization, um, whoops, sorry, um, almost four million people die every year from outdoor air pollution. And a little more than four million people die every year from indoor pollution from cook stoves and things like that. So how we generate power, whether, whether it's indoors or outdoors for electric power, that is a huge burden and kills more than 7 million people every year. We have obvious examples, like the Olympics uh, that came to Atlanta in uh, 19, uh, uh, 1996. And the city officials said, hey, the athletes are coming, the Olympics are here, we really want to clean up the city, clean up our air, let's reduce traffic. Let's mandate some temporary laws and reduce traffic. And so they reduced traffic by uh, 23% and that, you know, reduced pollution. They saw a 28% decrease in ground level ozone, smog ozone, which is very, uh, is triggers asthma in children if there's too much ozone. And no surprise, asthma related emergency room visits declined by 42%. Now, how many of you are here in the public health of the MPH program? And how many of you are budding epidemiologists? And of course, you guys would say, wait a second, 
you know, less traffic, maybe there are less people driving to the emergency room, right? You got to control for that. And these guys, these are epidemiologists, and they found that, well, children's ER visits for non-asthma cases didn't change. So it wasn't just less. So anyway, so we have a, a good epi study that shows less traffic, less pollution, less asthma. So we know, we know that pollution has a direct effect on, on health. Now, looking systematically across the United States, asking the question, what would it take to get to a low carbon society if we took our US energy system and we invested in renewable energy and, and greener technology? And I don't have all the, the details are in the, in the paper. This is a paper in Nature Climate Change from a couple of years ago. But, you know, the green technology, you know, there's an upfront investment to get to greener technology. But if we look at the result, if you were to get to cleaner energy, because not only do you reduce carbon emissions, but you reduce all those nasty, you know, nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide and PM 2.5, the fine particles that kill the most, that's the most dangerous component of air, air pollution. The health benefits, if you were to reduce, you know, clean up the energy system, the benefits from less mortality and from hospitalization could offset the investments, the upfront investments, anywhere between 26 and 1,050%. Now that's a big range, so a lot of error, a lot of, you know, but still we're talking about the health benefits being it, between a quarter to 10 times in value to the upfront investment costs of clean energy. Um, our group is looking at this in China. We're modeling, you know, if you were to reduce fossil fuel um, emissions, reduce burning coal, um, what would that mean for health because of a reduction in PM 2.5? Um, and um, if you were to reduce 32% of emission, uh, PM 2.5 from coal, in China, you would save more than 100 million years of life. So that's how dirty China is. If you were to reduce 32% of the emissions, you save 100 million life years. And if you got rid of all of the PM 2.5 emissions, we're talking about 400 million years of life saved per year. This is like in the year 2030. This is not up to, this is in the year 2030, that's how many years of life could be saved from getting rid of PM 2.5, which is why yesterday or the day before, I saw on Twitter that at the uh, Dave Davos uh, World Economic Forum, the head of China saying, uh, you know, stepping up and defending the Paris Agreement. Because China knows it's not just climate change, we got to get off of fossil fuels. We would love to save 400 million years of life and get away from this dirty energy. And they've, they've, uh, they just, they were about to build 140 new coal fire power plants. They said, no, we're not doing that. So, you know, there are health reasons. If you just forget climate mitigation, there are health reasons. And China knows this to get off of burning coal and burning um, oil. So, I'm going to show a slide that um, I think is really important for policymakers. You think about, you know, it, it does cost some money to get to cleaner energy, and maybe for every ton of CO2 that you pull out of the atmosphere, uh, it could cost $30 for cleaner energy. But remember, you know, re getting rid of that greenhouse gas emission, the CO2, you also get rid of all the other nasty pollutants. And so, Every, for every ton of CO2 that you pull out of the atmosphere, the PM 2.5 that you remove is so much that you would save $200 in health benefits. So, you know, I, I presented this to the state legislature in Wisconsin. And when I did this, they, they said, you know, we've only been thinking about the cost of energy. And we admit we hadn't thought about that side of the equation. 
And so I asked them, well, here's a tough question, you know, which number is bigger? And right now, you know, most politicians and decision makers are only focused on the left side of the equation. What do we have to pay for, for cleaner energy? And not thinking about the enormous health benefit we would have. And if you live in other parts of the world, you ha even have greater benefits, like in India and China, where you really have bad pollution problems. So this is something that is extremely important to convey that it's not, we're not talking just about energy and mitigating climate change. We're talking about a golden opportunity for health and, and health, health cost savings. And maybe it's not even that expensive anymore. The, this is looking at the cost of solar since the 1970s. The price of solar has dropped 99%. So I've seen a lot of solar on campus. I've seen solar in Vermont. So, you know, this is getting very realistic. You know, we can have a solar, uh, solar and wind power is getting competitive. So when you see um, charts, uh, a, 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 a diagram like this uh, that shows you how much known oil reserve we have in the ground. And for the case of climate change mitigation to stabilize and stay below two degrees centigrade, that's all we can burn. And the argument is, hey, to stabilize at two degrees centigrade, we can't really burn much more oil. You know, we have, you know, five times as much known oil reserve as we should be allowed to burn, you know, before we get above this, you know, this threshold of two degrees, it's thought to be more catastrophic once you go above that. So on top of this argument, we can add the health argument and say, it's not just about stabilizing climate. It's a great idea if you just ignore climate change altogether and say, burning less fossil fuels is a wonderful health benefit. So I want to shift gears and just talk about two other quick things besides energy. I want to talk about trends in chronic disease. Uh, this is a study that came out across um, 200 countries, looking at 19 million people. And the bottom line is that all across the world, rates of obesity are increasing. And we know how important that is for health and the, the, all the diseases, the chronic diseases related to that. So one opportunity here is to, if we can increase physical fitness and tackle that problem, we have a, a, a group uh, in my research uh, program that's studying this, using this integrated transport and health impact model, ITHIM, and it's looking at very well-documented relationships between exercise and thinking about metabolic equivalent per task for walking for biking you know that we know that if you can increase just minutes minutes of per week of physical activity you see a relative risk reduction in cardiovascular disease in diabetes dementia depression colon cancer breast cancer and and uh, so we see these, these, some of these major chronic diseases. Unbelievable opportunity. If we can just crank up a little more exercise. And if you look at, you know, if you just, in my state of Wisconsin, added 10 minutes per week, you know, that's two minutes a day in a, in a work week, two minutes per day, add two minutes more exercise per day, you would see you know, a reduction of 24, you know, annually, 24 less breast cancer patients, 27 colon cancer, more than 300 less heart attacks, dementia, depression, 99 fewer diabetics per year by increasing exercise by two minutes per day in a work week. And there are big costs to these chronic diseases. 
You know, you can, you can have cost savings uh, across these chronic diseases. And if you were to monetize the, the value of, you know, what if, now nationally, according to the National Transportation Survey, the national average commuting, active commute time, so walking or biking, this is actually, this is just for walking. On average, Americans commute 35 minutes per week. So that's seven minutes per day is the average exercise for commuting. Now, people can have non-commuting exercise, but if you look at the average US population who might not be in a university and have access to a gym or not be able to afford a gym, you know, there's a lot of inactivity in this country. And cities have been built for the automobile rather than for people. But if we were to take the average of 35 minutes per week, and if we were to double that to 70 minutes per week, um, we would save, you know, just across looking at depression, diabetes, and heart disease, we would save uh, $10 billion a year in avoided health costs. If we were to get to the minimum level of recommended exercise, that's 30 minutes five days a week is the minimum recommended level of exercise. So that's 150 minutes, 30 minutes times five, 150 minutes, we would save $27 billion in avoided health costs. So, you know, these are, these are important. And then um, my cousin asked me, uh, well, how would those health costs translate to insurance premiums? So these are some important messages to say, you know, this is why our insurance is high. Uh, Deborah Lopez was saying, we have unhealthy habits. We have a golden opportunity here to improve health and reduce the cost of healthcare. So I want to end because we do have a, a little reception. Uh, I don't know, it, drinks and food or just drinks? A little bit of both. Okay. So I want to just end with the last uh, area of health co-benefits from climate change policy, food and agriculture. And if I don't, you can probably read this in the front, but maybe not in the back. This uh, Cal the banner says, uh, I am full of greenhouse gas. Do you have a stake in it? And uh, I took that picture when I was walking with my then 89-year-old mother, um, walking for three hours in the climate, uh, you know, the uh, People's Climate March in New York City. This is a graph that probably all of you know that if we eat lower on the food chain, you know, less red meat in the diet, um, it's better for the environment and better for our health. This is a high meat diet. This is a medium meat diet, a low meat diet. This is a fish diet, vegetarian and vegan. And this is looking at the carbon dioxide equivalents, you know, tractors and diesel and fertilizers and water and everything. The carbon, the environmental, you know, the carbon dioxide equivalent as far as what it takes to produce protein from, from these different sources. So that's an obvious one, and I think you guys know that here in, in Vermont. Um, we're looking at uh, something else. Uh, I don't know what you're serving, Christine and Susan, but um, I have a, a, an incredible student who's working on a study of insects as a sustainable protein source. And, you know, I'm not going to necessarily uh, tell you that that's what we're having, or is it? I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, there is a grab, ba uh, grab bag uh, pot of something, right? But think about it. You know, when you compare the amount of feed that it takes to raise protein from cattle, from pigs, from chickens, from a cricket, that's a cricket. You know, insects are more sustainable, you know, and think about the amount of, uh, of that animal that you eat. You know, you only eat a portion of the cow and you can see that, you know, you eat more of the cricket, right? Now, I'm still not convincing you, I'm sure. 
But I mean, we have to be thinking about food systems because how we eat, you know, it really dictates how much water, land, and energy emissions we're using, depending on where we get our protein from. And the kilogram of protein derived from legume vegetables is far more sustainable environmentally than from these other sources. And uh, comparing, um, you know, looking at uh, percent of protein by weight, looking at cows, chickens, and mealworms, that was her study looking at mealworms, um, you know, was it's dramatic advantage and other benefits as far as uh, B12 and iron. Look, this is actually from crickets. So we're looking into that and, um, you know, this idea, it's called entomophagy, eating insects. And we're studying the, the safety of micro livestock. I think it's called uh, mini livestock now. Uh, but anyway, um, and looking at food safety issues. You know, I, this is not far-fetched, but this is something to think about. You know, our food system really determines uh, a lot with the environment and our own health. Uh, but I don't want to open a whole can of worms on this one. <laughs> the next time Christine invites me back, I'm going to bring Valerie, and we're going to show you some really cool research. So I want to end by just uh, reminding you of the many um, unhealthy exposures that climate change poses. I really do think that climate change is one of our toughest challenges. It's one of our biggest environmental public health challenges of, of these times, but that actions to mitigate climate change, to get to a low carbon economy, a healthy energy society, um, they are enormous benefits, especially when you think about um, changes in energy production, uh, transportation, urban planning, and in food systems. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And if you want, you can follow me on Twitter anytime. Thank you, Jonathan, for a very provocative talk. I think that many people will probably have questions. Um, I know I have a few myself, especially about the insects. We have an insect grower here in Vermont. I don't know if, wow. Yeah, we'll introduce you, and Valerie, when you come back. Huh. But in the meantime, um, if you do have a question, please raise your hand, and we will get the microphone right to you. Go right back. So thanks for a great talk. 30, 40 years ago, smoking was very accepted. We now live on a campus where not only is tobacco free, but I think if you see someone smoking, right, it provokes a reaction. But yet, despite that all of us here buy into climate change, driving your single occupancy vehicle to campus is socially accepted, right? And those of us that bike commute are sort of these real outliers. So how do you change people that actually buy into climate change and get them to change their, their culture? Obviously, you've adopted it, but, but you're probably a rarity on your campus as well uh, among people that buy into climate change. And so that's sort of my question. So the changing change, of the culture. Changing the social norms. Um, great question. You know, and I said this to at lunch to the students, people will not do what they should do if it's inconvenient. Uh, I tell a story, you know, I bicycle because it's selfish. It's the fastest way for me to get to work. I, I once had to testify in the state legislature and pick someone up at the airport. I said, I have to drive today. You know, I'm working on my PowerPoint. I look at my watch and I said, oh my God, I'm going to be late for the tes testimony. So I said, I, I don't have time to drive and park and whatever, I, you know. So it ha And so I live in Madison, Wisconsin, gold rank for bikeability. So it has to be by design. You have to really go upstream and talk to urban planners and talk to um, dietary, you know, whoever is putting the default menu that it's a vegetarian rather than meat and potatoes. It's got to be by design, upfront design. So this is what's going to take a cross-sectoral approach in planning and design so that, you know, the single occupancy vehicle, uh, it's going to, it's not, it's, it's going to be inconvenient, especially when you think about traffic. If you have great mass transit, 
or better bike lanes or better inter interconnectedness of, of different alternative modes of transportation. You know, when it becomes inconvenient, you know, then people say, I don't want to drive. This happened in Bogota, Colombia. And they, they started the bus rapid transit system. And people didn't want to be stuck in traffic for hours and they started taking it. And so it's a matter of intentional design for sustainability. Um, and and be, being very aware that you can't just ask people to do stuff because they should. But this is where there are great opportunities for um, urban planning and, and their win-wins. When they did this um, uh, ur tactical urban experiment in New York and they blocked off Broadway, you know, the, the shop owners were screaming at first, saying, whoa, we we're going to have less traffic, less business. It was the opposite that happened. You know, they had, people said, well, pedestrian mall, we love it. Business source. So it's those types of uh, opportunities to take advantage of. Great question. Hi. Um, well, I have two things. The first thing I wanted to ask you was about the natural gas in China. Um, how are they getting that gas? Are they fracking? And does fracking also put the PM 2.5 into the atmosphere? And if they are fracking, why not just skip the natural gas and go right to renewables? Because you're not helping the climate by fracking. And then I'm going to put in a little plug. Um, I'm part of the Pipeline Coalition here in Vermont. We have a week of... Um, action coming up February 4th through the 11th. I've hit some of you up with our little flyers. I'll leave more out front. We are trying to stop the um, Vermont gas pipeline going through. But I do want to have the, your answer to the question about why go to natural gas, because once you're hooked on natural gas, right, right. you know, what's yeah. the incentive to go to renewables? So it's a great question, and I'm not qualified to fully answer it. So I'll just tell you that, uh, you know, the issues that I know about fracking are that with all the methane leakage, it's not beneficial to the climate. But let's pretend, let's pretend that wasn't an issue, that the methane wasn't leaking. Let's pretend they fix that. The idea that natural gas as a bridge, um, people debate that and say, you know, yes, we got to get away from, it's an opportunity cost. You invest in fracking, and natural gas, it's better immediately if we solve the methane issue, which we haven't. Um, but it does take away from other renewable, you know, uh, real renewable energy uh, investment. Um, so I would defer to the energy experts. There are some benefits to natural gas if the methane, if the methane can be controlled. But the fracking, you know, the fracking fluids is still an issue. Um, the frac sand, they're, they're huge issues with fracking. So I don't promote fracking, but, um, and, and I sort of agree with you, but I, I'm not the expert in it. Uh, hi. So it seems like from like a national level, it might be pretty difficult to, or international level, to mitigate the public health effects of climate change. So I guess like, to what extent do you think uh, these can be mitigated through trying to regulate microclimate and like urban greening and stuff like that at like more of a local level? <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I think that um, this is where it's exciting because it's at the urban, it's at the city level and these sub-national levels that were getting incredible progress. Um, the C40 Cities program, the, you know, Mayor Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg, and some others, you know, these are mega cities around the world, more than 40 now. And they are committed to climate change mitigation and, and getting, you know, having all sorts of, you know, activities at the urban level, um, making huge progress. And you've heard California, you've heard, um, you know, Jerry Brown saying, whatever the nation does, we're still committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We don't care what the feds do. 
And this is where there's a, an R20 initiative that's international, which is regional, sub-national, um, you know, state level and region level, groups coming together saying, you know, there is slow movement at national levels. And international agreements, hopefully they'll do something, but we're not gonna wait around. And so there are, you know, innovations and progress getting to a green society, green energy society, all over the place, and especially at the local level. So I think the cities and states are gonna be driving the, the, the agenda. And so, as I have to say, you know, I'm, you know, I, all scientists, climate scientists and climate impact scientists are watching, we're on alert. You know, we're a little bit, you know, we, we're watching what's going on with the new administration we have some concerns. We don't know what they mean, really, but we're watching a little more vigilantly. vigilantly. Um, and so at the same time, I have huge optimism at the local level, you know, what's going on there, so. Hi, great talk. Two questions for you. Uh, the first is, as a physician, I'm wondering how you've been able to harness your uh, credibility to help move legislatures. And the second question I have is, you seem very optimistic, and um, which, which is very refreshing, especially given our current political climate. Um, and it's interesting, when I reflect on a talk that Bill McKibben gave at, at the hospital a while back, um, it was, it was, it was a, a, a much more pessimistic talk, and I think a lot of us feel somewhat pessimistic, and I'm wondering how you, uh, maintain your optimism in, in light of the fact that we're 2.5 minutes away from doomsday. <laughs> well, I think that, um, I think the medical community has a very important role. You know, I think that looking at the, the narrative and the communication that has to be out there, uh, you know, we need the actual, you know, personal impact. And, you know, when you talk about the children with asthma, uh, because of increased ragweed seasons and, and, you know, when you get to the, you know, the actual health dimension and look at, at you know, patients, I think that's very, a very important part of climate change communication. Um, you know, we want to be as, as honest and objective as possible, uh, but built, not but, but and built into that is that, you know, population studies and relative risks translate to people and when you when you look at the clinical situation uh, and you see you know more ozone you know red alert ozone days and you've got children that are coming in with asthma you know that's a problem I mean we did some modeling about the number of red ozone alert days that would happen just from temperature alone it goes way up and those red ozone alert days red ozone alert days mean kids with asthma having problems. So I think it's very important. There is a, a, a rising uh, effort. There's, of course, physicians responsible for PSR, Physicians for uh, Social Responsibility, has been doing this for a while. There's a new group that's even more international that includes PSR um, called the Climate and Health um, Alliance. There's an international one, and there's a U.S. Climate and Health Alliance. It's where um, it's an entry for uh, the medical profession to come in, and of course the green hospitals, the healthcare without harm, and the green hospital movement uh, is very strong. Uh, Kaiser Permanente has been pushing this pretty hard. Uh, Gary Cohen is the director of this. So the health profession is saying, you know, we want to take care of our patients and today's population without burdening the next generation. So if we are you know, treating people, and yet we are pumping out a lot of PM 2.5 and harming populations downwind from our hospital. We don't want to do that. I mean, so hospitals are becoming much more aware of that. So that healthcare without harm and the green hospitals movement is a really important one. Hi, I was wondering what the decrease in biodiversity, how that's going to affect the amount of diseases going on with animals and insects. Mm. Uh, well, I bumped into a student uh, 
who's an expert in disease models, they could probably answer that more than me. I, it's, um, that's, it's a tricky question. Um, we've done some studies uh, looking at changing ecosystems in the Amazon and showing that if you reduce biodiversity, especially you change the landscape and change the biodiversity of mosquitoes in the Peruvian Amazon, disrupting that that network, that um, you know, the, that biodiversity changes in a negative way, and the malaria uh, carrying mosquito, Anopheles darlingi, in that region, dominates when you disrupt the ecosystem. So there are some other cases where it can go the other way. You know, the amount of biodiversity, including pathogen biodiversity in the jungle um, means there are more pathogens out there. So it's a tricky dynamic. Uh, I can't tell you, you, you disrupt an ecosystem, you change biodiversity, you will always get worse disease. I don't know that. But um, generally, a lot of these species are held in check, and that includes pathogens. And if you disrupt that ecosystem and the biodiversity, there's potential for one of these to emerge. Um, but that's a tricky question. Good question, but hard to answer. We have time for just one more question. So uh, my question is, uh, there's two questions. Uh, one is that the county just north of here and the county just south of here uh, are heavily agriculture areas. And how do you uh, suppose that a state like Vermont, which really values agricultural heritage, balance that with your recommendations for moving away from traditional agriculture. And also, uh, most of Vermont is not as urban as where we are right now, where I come from, it's a 15 mile commute to uh, where I work over the summer. And my question there is, how do you put those urban planning and transportation models into effect there to try to receive those same benefits? Yeah, no, good question. Uh, I'll just say two things. I think that uh, depending where you live, you'll have different strategies. So in an urban environment, having, you know, alternative transportation and it really equi equitable transportation, the opportunity for people to commute how they want to commute from good mass transit or from walking or from biking and mass transit, whatever, that works in an urban environment. Now, since 2006, the world is more urban than rural. And we're, you know, the trajectory is that in a few decades, 75% of the world will live in cities. So I think we have a golden opportunity to do work in cities and have a major impact. However, you know, especially Vermont, mostly rural, and I think that, you know, transportation in rural areas, it's probably not, it's, it's, it's not practical to bike um, unless you, uh, you know, you know, and you have great distance, it's probably not practical. There, you know, having a fuel efficient or electric vehicle that's hopefully electricity from renewables, you know, a lot, you know, better technology for the vehicles might be the answer for transportation in the rural setting. As far as agriculture, I'm not the expert, um, but I can tell you that from the experts that I talk to, there are huge opportunities in in more you know, more organic, not, not that organic farming is everything, but integrated systems where, you know, let's say you don't eat the mealworms like my student is studying, but you feed the mealworms to chickens or, and then, you know, or you've got a few cows that are, you know, creating manure and then you've got your own maggots that feed chicken. I mean, there are so many ways of, of better, more sustainable farming practices that as probably at least a dozen people in this room know far better than me, and, and Vermont is probably, I think you're a leader in, in that type of smart agriculture. So, um, you know, I, I can't say more than that other than to, you know, look at many different solutions and where you know that agricultural practices can be improved upon and made more sustainable, pursue those diverse approaches uh, and not think about needing to have the same transportation in rural versus urban. They're, they're two, different, two different populations. So 
be very um, flexible and diverse in approaches to solving the problem. I'd like to just take a moment and thank you all for sharing your time with us and engaging in this very important topic. We want to continue the conversation. We have some refreshments back there. Jonathan will be with us for a little bit longer, so please feel free to come up and continue the conversation. And please join me in thanking Dr. Pats. Thank you. Thank you.